The Kosher Deli, a local hangout home to favorites like pastrami and some strong opinions, at least when it comes to meat that's grown in a lab. What is this? So what am I looking at? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that idea. <laughs> Doesn't look too tasty. Yeah. I might try, but not, not very enthusiastic. It doesn't matter if you're in a deli in New York or a halal butcher shop in London. People seem to react to these images the same way. Go ahead. Take a look at it, yeah. And that will be very expensive as well. So there's no need to do that. It's a problem for the multi-billion dollar lab-grown meat industry, which is still in its infancy, but hoping to produce the exact same meat, just without the animal cruelty and high environmental costs. One thing that might help millions around the world stomach the idea is to get lab-grown meat certified as halal or kosher. It'd be another stamp of approval beyond regulatory oversight from governments. But is that even possible? Is it? <laughs> you know, you're talking to a rabbi, it's never gonna be that simple. This is Lab Made, a series about an industry challenging the way we think about food and whether it can live up to its promise of changing the world. This is Joel Kenigsberg. He's a rabbi who's written on issues of Jewish laws and modern technology. And this is Abdul Majid. He's an Islamic scholar and consultant for UK-based halal certification organization. People in their positions all over the world interpret religious texts like the Torah or Quran for devotees. Parts of those texts, which have been compiled centuries and millennia ago, form sets of dietary laws known as kashrut and halal. There's dozens of rules, and a lot of them are about meat. Which species meat can come from, how these animals should be slaughtered. But what if the meat was grown in a lab? Uh, like a chicken breast. Strange. I think when it first came out, the, f the first reaction was just, what is this? You know, what is this and, and why would you need it? If you're not familiar with it, here's a quick rundown of how lab-grown meat is produced. A cell is taken from an animal and put in a solution that's similar to blood. They then multiply inside a fermenter that simulates the conditions inside an animal's body. Then, they're formed into pieces of meat. In some cases, using 3D printers. Certifying lab-grown meat as halal or kosher opens it up to a $1.3 trillion market. But things can get complicated. And depending on which rabbi or imam you ask, you'll get a different answer. Here are three important questions being asked. First, from which species did the cell used to make lab-grown meat come from? It would need to come from a kosher species of animal. So it still retains the identity uh, of the animal that it came from, you know, if we could put it like that. Kosher and halal species include cows and goats. Pigs are the most prominent example of what's forbidden in both religions. The cell is taken from the pig and it is made into flesh. Then still you are eating the flesh of, or a meat of a pig. So, no lab-grown bacon, and no squirrels, kangaroos, horses, camels, or zebras. Yes, there is a company trying to grow zebra meat. The second question is, is the animal from which the cell was taken still alive? Both Judaism and Islam prohibit taking meat from a living animal. They require that animals are slaughtered quickly and by letting the blood drain. In Islam, a butcher also says a prayer as this happens. If you have slaughtered the animal properly, and you have preserved part of that meat and you are using it in the lab and then you're producing meat from that, it's halal. But here's the problem. Many lab-grown meat companies are taking cells from animals still alive and killing animals kind of goes against their ethos of no animals were harmed in the making of this burger. It may well be that only if the cells are taken after slaughter would the lab-grown meat be kosher. But there's a third question and it might make the first two irrelevant. Is lab-grown meat, well, meat? From this facility here, we can create a, a couple hundred kilograms a week of cultivated chicken meat. This is Sher Friedman. She's the co-founder of Supermeat, a lab-grown meat company I visited in Israel. In the early days of lab-grown meat, the cells used to grow the meat came from animal muscles. It's meat from beginning to end, but that's changed. Our initial cell source is stem cells. So we're taking our cells from a fertilized egg that's only a couple of hours old. So the animal that we're eating was never born or killed. 
Stem cells are special because they can develop into different types of cells. Muscle, blood, whatever you want. So if the starter cell was meat, then you could argue that the end product isn't meat either, even if it looks like it, smells like it, and tastes like it. If we were to take that line of reasoning, then there would be much more room to say, maybe this is not meat, maybe this does not have all the same restrictions. From a kosher standpoint, this could mean that lab-grown meat would be considered pariva, a category of neutral foods that contains neither meat nor milk. Lab-grown meat would be no different from, say, a potato. So how do we get to the bottom of this? The venture-backed startup as a model for how lab-grown meat gets made creates a natural informational problem. This is Ben Wergaft. He's written a lot about the lab-grown industry, which is very tight-lipped about the details of their technology. People, however transparent they would like to be, have a commitment to generate and protect intellectual property. They have to protect their investors' money. The rabbis, you know, are waiting for the companies to, to say how it's made. At the same time, the companies want to know the answer if, you know, is it going to be kosher? In other words, something of a game of lab-grown chicken. But this isn't new. Thousands of companies have disclosed their recipes in order to get their products kosher or Blal certified. And that includes the famously secretive Coca-Cola. In the 1920s, Coke was all the rage, and rabbis across America were being asked if it was kosher. One rabbi named Tobias Geffen convinced Coke executives to let him look at the ingredients list. Thanks to a personal connection with the company's corporate lawyer, they agreed. After inspecting the ingredients, Geffen advised several changes. In his ruling, or teshuva, he was extremely careful not to reveal the recipe. Coke is now kosher certified year round. And during Passover, there's an extra twist. If you see Coke bottles with yellow caps, it's because they're made with sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup. One lasting impact from Coke certification is that it established a basis of trust between religious authorities and food corporations. So that reassured the manufacturers that the rabbis would not reveal trade secrets. And then it also persuaded the rabbis that it was feasible to engage in a dialogue with large food manufacturers. And it turns out, there's a halo effect that comes with certifying something as kosher or halal. Do you remember that $1.3 trillion market we mentioned? A big part of that actually comes from non-Jewish or Muslim consumers. In a survey carried out in the US, a majority buy certified products because of quality and safety reasons. So there's a lot of anxiety about food, which results in interest in using labels by third-party agents who are not involved with the manufacturing of it to testify or certify what's in there. Because of the stringency of kosher laws, they're trusted by other groups for, for that purpose. So that's, that's your halo effect. It's still early days for lab grown meat, which is only available to the public in Singapore, and it's not clear whether a kosher or halal certification would sway non-religious consumers towards it. In Israel, a ruling from March this year by several rabbis suggested, yes, it's kosher. But in Indonesia, the world's biggest Muslim-majority country, one leading authority said no, it's haram, or forbidden, the opposite of halal. Whether it is technology, whether it is, you know, uh, digital things or electronic things, anything that is coming up is part of our religion, it's part of Islam. And whatever the things mentioned in the Quran is being explored centuries after centuries. You know, we believe in a religion that is engaged with the world. We found the ways to apply ancient law and help us move, move the world forward. And there's no reason why we can't do it with, uh, with us either. Only in New York. Turkey that's supposed to be like chicken, you know? Well, it's an attempt, yeah. you know, an attempt it, it, to make it, it look uh, like yeah. uh, Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. He says, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. A chicken by other form would taste as good. Uh -huh. <laughs> Why not? <laughs>